right, everybody. So today on the podcast, we have, I'm going to say Pac, uh, but maybe you, Pac, can just t- tell everybody your full name here. My full name is Dave Smith. Nah, I'm joking. Uh, my full name is Patrick Los Andre Lex Krakakis, but even Greek friends and Greek people that know me call me Pac. I've been going by Pac since I was a kid, and it just sticks. I don't tell people call me that, but it just sticks for some reason. Yeah, it's funny. I, I actually remember the first time I heard your name in the industry, and it was Eric Helms who said the entire name. Always. And at first, I, I almost thought it. I was like, "Did I hear that right?" I was, you know, because you're Greek, and that, and it made more sense because I saw it spelled out. But I almost thought like, "Was that a joke or something?" <laughs> Such a long name, but yeah. Then he Aver- just said average, long back. average Greek interaction, but yeah, Helms. Um, shout out Eric. Um, has always. Uh, had the, that little flex about him with the name like he always does an insane job at uh, pronouncing it right yeah yeah, yeah. but uh yeah, so thank you for having me on absolutely man uh you know your popularity within the fitness space i've seen blow up quite a bit in the last couple of years i guess i mean obviously you were involved before that but i've certainly seen you around much more in the last few years uh we were just talking about you're now with strong by science with dr wolf and who i've had on a couple times before and I think that's a big part of it. And then also just you being involved with some of the length and partial research lately and kind of discussing that. So for people who maybe still are not as familiar with you, what was your background getting into this? Because I even I messaged you the other day. I didn't even realize some of your strength background and, and how impressive some of your lifts were. Yeah. So my background, um, I guess, was so my PhD was in powerlifting um, on the least one needs to get stronger in the minimum effective training dose. I've been doing research since I was about 21 or so when I started also to also teach part time at a university uh, right before I got into the PhD. But I was doing research before I got into a PhD and I'm a lifter who loves lifting stuff. Um, even though I've done some power lifting in the past, I would not identify as a power lifter, nor have I ever power lifted to a serious extent. I've dabbled in a bit of power lifting when I was younger. And I'm just a lifter who loves lifting for muscle growth and strength and really enjoys the research part of that um, and also coaches people in order to improve their body composition, strength, um, including competitive athletes, both in the strength and physique sport realms. Gotcha. Okay. So so you do um, actually train competitors as well then? Yeah, for many years. I have a competitor uh, competing, a competitor competing. I have one of my athletes and close friends competing next uh, Tuesday. No, next Tuesday, the Tuesday after, actually, internationally in the the IPF. But I've coached mul- like multiple powerlifting athletes that compete at a high level, some bodybuilders, some strongmen and strong women, and uh, firefighters, um, active military personnel, yada, 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 like hundreds of individuals over the years. But I don't talk much about the coaching because it's all going on in the background. Um, and yeah, I don't feel the need to. Yeah, yeah, sure. And and just curious, I know I saw one or two of your big lists, but what would what are your best, let's call it, say big four, so the big three in overhead press? Sure, sure. So I, I'm not a big fan of benching. I have really solid the chest genetics from my dad and a good clavicle structure. I'm wearing a jumper now, otherwise at flex insert go to my profile whatever but i never liked pressing so my best bench is only 160 160 kilos which in pounds um let me compare to freedom units is uh a mere 350 sad uh i've squatted uh, 600 though well 595 to be exact um raw in competition back in the day when i was 21 Uh, my best deadlift is uh 287 and a half which is i think 635 and my best overhead press at the moment is 105 kilos, which is 231 pounds. Strict, no leg drive, all those. Like the, the shame with OHP is that because there's no standard like competition form. Right, right. Yeah. People are like, yeah, I overhead press this. And then you look at the video and it's like a push press mix starting below the chin. And you're like, eh. but anyways, those are my best lifts. That's awesome, man. No, very strong. I, did, I just saw an overhead press recently and the, and the weight was very impressive, but it started on pins that were at almost like his mouth level, not even his chin. And then he was like leaning back. It's like an incline press. And again, like super impressive weight, but it's just like at that point, what what is the point really other than to just be able to claim that number? You see that a lot with the red presses. Exactly. Are you talking about uh, Andrew? 
That, that super yes i am <laughs> the yeah. canadian guy right it's like the super obese like four or five hundred pound overhead you presser said it not me yeah yeah, yeah. Who, who looked really good and then but really enjoys being the way he is now which i'm not actually sense. familiar with him that much other than i just had alex leonidas on the podcast and he mentioned him to me so i had to look him up uh, and obviously, I mean, the fact that you could even move 500 pounds to any degree over your head is insanely impressive. But yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. they were half reps and the whole thing was a little bit bizarre. Yeah, exactly. That's the issue. Like at that level, if you're not doing it in competition, I fail to see the the justification. But hey, to each his own, right? What do yeah. I know? Now, just curious, did you say your best squat was when you were 21 years old? Yeah. Interesting. Now, is that because you would no longer train for it or... Okay. Yeah, I've I've squatted four or five, front squatted four or five. And because my legs are naturally relatively big and strong, I am just doing a few heavy sets on the squat and the deadlift as my leg training for the past few years. But like, oh, interesting. like I'm still chasing a 300 kilo deadlift. So that covers a lot of the hamstring and glute stimulus as far as maintaining mm. adaptations. But I, I was always one of those guys that... Um, like the, my legs match or if not exceed my upper body maybe not anymore but they they're still there like i'm still squatting for um for plates for a few reps high yeah. bar and stuff but i got a bit burned out with squatting for i sure. used to love squatting to the point where I, there were weeks where i would just squat oh, so well, i would really? just do nothing else but squats uh and then it's because it's a psychological lift for me it came a point where i was like eh, i don't enjoy training it that much um i'm not willing to do a hard leg session because my legs are already big and strong so we'll just maintain them by lifting heavy and still doing something yeah no i feel you on that um i mean a 600 pound squat for anybody is very impressive let alone a 21 year old obviously you don't see that too often um uh, that's kind of how i felt with bench press after a while i had kind of and even deadlift to some degree i kind of hit numbers that i was pretty happy with and i just thought okay it, there's somewhat of an ego aspect to that lift and for me to get back to doing that obviously there's an injury potential but even that aside it just i, I don't think it's going to change much for me in terms of the muscle mass i carry and so eventually um, it was so distant from what i'm doing now that i, I kind of just decided i'm just not going to go back to that lift obviously i still try to progress with what i do but not in that key lift yeah and that's what put me off powerlifting as well i love lifting and most of my training now is like 98 percent hypertrophy focused mm. aside from those like heavy deadlifts uh, squats and the singles that i do for ohp and i train like four to maybe seven times per week usually four to six times per week but the flexibility of that type of training and the this this attachment i guess from a part from particular lifts is so relieving for somebody like myself for other people i get the appeal because with the with powerlifting or being very attached to specific lifts you all of a sudden have you'll have days where like your lower back aches a bit more or whatever it's just not feeling right and when you're training for hypertrophy you can simply just go okay i'm not going to do this today i'll do something else and that's uh that feels quite nice yeah, the flexibility with hypertrophy based training is great. It obviously there's some negatives to it in that it can be harder to focus. Like, you know, some people they just go all over the place with their training and they stop focusing on progression and there's there's other potential issues, but I do think that the ability to just transition to what works for you at that given time is great. And it's one of the reasons that really bodybuilding more than any other quote unquote sport has a great longevity aspect to it. You know, obviously the power related sports drop off pretty young. Powerlifting, you still see some great progress into people's 40s, but more injury potential in bodybuilding. It's like, man, you got people who are competing at a pretty high level into their 50s. Yeah, for sure. And like even, even if you look at long term, long term data on powerlifting and strength development, um, top gains are possible even in the masters one and two athletes, um, which is great. And overall, I think more people like even like because i see people that force powerlifting in their lives we're going off in a, a bit of a tangent here but like they it's sort of they feel like they have to do it because it's somewhat part of their identity but you can see that they have the same injuries occurring over and over again that are easy to address injuries because they're mostly from overuse or because they're doing like they're, they're forcing the deadlift or the squats on days where they shouldn't be um and Having chats with them, I I constantly tell them that hey, you know, you could 
also give this a, a break for a bit, do something else. You're not going to lose muscle mass, and it's likely that you're going to be totally fine when you return upon it. Obviously, though, they're not world champions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry. No, no, it's all good. Um, so obviously, in, in the last, let's say, couple of years, well, maybe a year or so, you've one of the things you've become more popular for is this lengthened, these lengthened partials, right? Basically, this what used to be called half reps, but obviously it's a little different than what maybe is typically thought of as fewer reps. So if you think back for a long time, people who were doing partials were seen as maybe cutting reps short. It seemed like a negative thing. Obviously, Dr. Mike Israel, team full ROM and, and all of that. Um, and then in the last, let's say, year or two, we've seen some of this research that I think most listeners are somewhat familiar with, and we had talked about with Dr. Milo. So recent study shows all of that just goes out the window and it's no longer needed. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. Shit study. Shame on us. I have started whipping myself 20 times a day because of that study uh, to apologize to the public and really sorry for the free research. Um, yeah, right. Allow me to say that length and parcels are Milo's baby for sure. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to help with some things, but that's an area of, re of research that Milo is like the, the facto expert in. Um, although the latest study we published was something that uh, is is something that is very close to my heart as well, given the overall involvement. Um but like, just just to give a bit of background, this study involved us uh, wanting to put lengthened partials to the hardest test at the moment and create a study with an ecologically valid design that informs the training practices of lifters versus adopting a design where we would compare, where we could have compared single exercises one to the other and just to see which one would lead to more growth we were like okay in practice people will perform multiple exercises some that don't favor length of partials in terms of resistance profile um, they will do a bunch of indirect work for some of the body parts that they may be interested in in growing and overall they will we assuming uh, we assume that they will also go very close to failure or to failure so we designed a study to where we essentially sacrifice some of the internal validity for that external validity in order to give people something that resembles real world, um, real world training. Um, because at the moment we had, at the moment before that study, we had a bunch of studies again that compared single exercises and beginners. And overall, the trend was: hey, length and partials and training at the, training at the stretch was important. Length and training versus shortened training, length and training came on top. And when it came to length and partials versus a full range of motion results, regardless of whether you want to include that one study that people um, claim shouldn't be included, um, it's they were either the same or slightly better than a full range of motion. And in some cases, um, they were more than slightly better. But so we designed the study, um, we recruited as trained of individuals as we could. We also went out of our way both in terms of IRB privileges, in terms of like getting those IRB, uh, IRB privileges, IRB not privileges, getting the IRB approval. We went out of our way in order to be able to include video footage of the participants, hmm. which is the first study. I, I think it's the first study, if not one of the first studies in our niche that has ever done that, just so people can see this is what they did. Yeah, yeah um, that's great. And um, overall, the results were that, hey, there wasn't much difference in terms of hypertrophy uh, when you compared a full range of motion with a stretch emphasis. Keep in mind, they had the same stretch end, end point. They paused for one second in the stretch, and they also like fully locked out their elbows, let's say, on the chest press versus just staying in the stretch and doing partials. Um, and my interpretation was that, like, cool, this shows that the stretch seems to be quite important. Obviously, you had eight different exercises. All sets were taken to failure. But when I say to failure, I mean to the point where the full range of motion condition was trying another rep. So they were essentially performing um, an RP 10 or 11, whatever partial where they were in the stretch, like really forcing it. Yeah. So the results were not that surprising. And we even made a bet with Milo uh, on the video that I released on my channel um, trying to predict the results. And I said essentially no difference because it was just just eight weeks and we had full range of motion with a stretch emphasis and multiple exercises like when yeah. you throw so much at it yes i still believe that there's something to lengthen partials but in that sort of comparison i mean favor the um, the odds were stacked against them if that makes sense 
Sure. Uh, can you go back briefly to, you mentioned there's a study that some people say should not be included. Can you just kind of expand it's on the, that? It's the Goto study where the the range of motion is argued because it's like a mid, depending on, on how you see it and how you conceptualize the, or how you tend to analyze, or not how you tend, how you approach your your analysis of the literature and what constitutes long length training and so on and so forth, because it's more of a mid range partial people are like, that's not a length and partial. But then when we're talking about comparing more length and training to short, uh, more shortened training, and it's just, it's, it's a bit of a, an unnecessary argument. Cause even if you remove that study, let's say you don't count it whatsoever. Right. Which I, I don't think that that makes sense. You're still left with, either the same or more growth by length and partials. Right. Yeah. But overall, I don't know, like I get the controversy to an extent. Look, this is a niche and this is um, a, a community, an echo chamber and um, what's the word? A scene. So like in any scene you get into, I like watches. So I'm not into the watch scene, but I'm observing the watch scene. People are fighting over whether the black dial is better than the slightly less black dial or yeah, whether yeah, the hour marker is too too round. Um, similarly here, I get that people want to, you know, I've assumed there's some conspiracy and there's all the like that partial cult and right. whatever, but... <laughs> Like the takeaway from the get go, and if you read any of the papers or listen to any of the podcasts where we talk about things uh, at length, pun unintended, the idea here is that, hey, if you're looking to absolutely maximize adaptations, it seems like having that lengthened, like training your muscles at longer lengths is good. Whether you choose to do a full, a full range of motion or do partials doesn't seem to matter that much. And at the same time, hey, you're trying to get the most out of it the same way people back a few years like a few years ago when we didn't have much research on many things would still do things because they were like there's a rationale for this zero evidence but because i want to make every educated bet at maximizing muscle growth uh, that i can i'll still do it same same concept here like you have some studies yes they're in beginners what's what does it cost you to do some like net partials nothing yeah worst case scenario you make the same growth so yeah rant over can you so i would say for i mean i've been hearing about it for a long time but some people would talk about stretch mediated hypertrophy and some studies showing hey by stretching the calves there's growth and whatnot can you just explain to people the difference between stretch mediated hypertrophy from let's just say a full stretch keeping it in that position versus length and partials so the the simplest way to explain this, and if you look, we recently released um, a systematic review on this, and the way it's presented and the way stretch-mediated hypertrophy is presented with absolute certainty is not the case. There are indications that, yeah, it does occur only uh, in beginners, but then there is data, even in advanced uh individuals more specifically shot put throwers and uh, that was actually from a greek lab where they where they also experienced um fascicle length increases but the easiest way to put it is length and partials do not have you uh, are, you're not stretching for nearly not even not even remotely long enough to experience stretch mediated hypertrophy as you would with like an intense calf stretch where you're there for multiple hours per week so the the problem is that it does sound it sounds cool like it's like uh, uh back in the day daily undulating periodization where even saying those words you were like yep here yeah. comes science baby yeah, I just yeah. wrote a daily undulating periodization program <laughs> same with this like intuitively it makes sense to call it like stretch mediated hypertrophy because you're focusing on the stretch but stretch mediated hypertrophy is something else and it's not uh, it's likely not what we're seeing because of length and partials. But if you want an in-depth breakdown of this, this is where Milo should be should be in my in my place. I feel like a discount Milo at the moment. No. <laughs> um, do you think that these are additive aspects of hypertrophy? Meaning, do you think over a long period of time, implementing, let's say, various techniques that would encourage stretch media hypertrophy would add on top of what you would see with regular training? Or do you think at the end of the day, if somebody is just following a typical hypertrophy program over many years, it's not going to make much of a difference to add that. I wouldn't be able to tell you with any sort of certainty. Um, my hunch is that based on, I, I mean, even a hunch would be 
uh, would be too speculative. I think that if you're training in a quote unquote traditional way and you are making sure your range of motion is long enough, you're including multiple exercises and you are training close to failure in a progressive manner, I doubt that you are missing on much as far as your genetic muscular potential goes, but I don't know. That would be my guess as well. I mean, I know Eric Helms, you know, actually went through the the calf <laughs> torture and, and he said he felt like there was a little bit of growth there. So maybe there's something to be added to it. But for the most part, I mean, even even if there was, you know, as a percentage of muscle mass gained over the course of his entire training career, probably very small. Now, of course, you could argue that was only done once and who knows if he continued. Um, but yes, most people aren't going to, and some muscles, I mean, we wouldn't even have a practical way necessarily to get it into an intense stretch for hours a day. Um, you know, like in his case, he had this boot that obviously brought the, his foot back and everything. I don't, there's some muscles where it's like, how would you even get that intense of a stretch and be able to deal with that level of pain? I mean, it's the whole, the practicality of it is pretty tough. Yeah. Cause, and I think you did something similar, didn't you? Or was that a calf experiment where without stretching? So, well, I, I've done many, many different things for my calves, but the one that I have become known for was that I did not train one of my calves for three years straight, and there was no difference after three years. Oh, wow. Respect. Yeah. I haven't trained my calves in <laughs> 12 years. Thankfully, blessed with uh, good enough calves where they look like either I have bad genetics and I train them pretty hard, or they just look like I don't yeah, train them. Right. Have good <laughs> but the one thing I wanted to say, yeah, there, there were also a couple of studies on the pecs, uh, one where they didn't measure hypertrophy, but they measured um, strength, strength um, at uh, isometrics. They did isometrics at longer lengths, and just by stretching the pecs, they saw some increases there. Uh, and there was another one, if I'm not mistaken, on the pecs where, where I might be mistaken, but the one on the calves with intense stretching, mm -hmm. the sad part about that was that it was compared to a 50, 45 minutes of resistance training per week. Um, three 15 minute sessions don't quote yeah, me on the okay. exact number but like yeah. it was either seven hours of intense intense stretching like nine to uh, ten out of ten if i'm not mistaken versus oh some traditional resistance training and the growth was the same but um i guess there may be implications for lifters because obviously there's the science side of things where okay let's see why this is occurring and what maybe there's 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 more things to discover there but from a training and practical application perspective as long as you're just lifting you're likely more than caught through the literal pain uh, of doing this type of training unless you know eric helms is also a muscle geek he didn't do it because his life depended on his calves being bigger he was like cool cool experiment we'll document it like i get that but unless you're that guy, um, I don't know. I wouldn't recommend it per se. I think it's uh, you're losing precious time there. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so going back a little bit to the length and partials aspect. So, yeah, I, I think for certain bodybuilders, they would say, hey, you know what? This has been going on for decades. You know, you can find some of the old school bodybuilders who are doing partial reps and, you know, maybe not going all the way, not locking out for, so for example, I never really would lock out my, um, barbell bench press. I mean, I'm not talking like half reps, but I would usually leave that last like two inches. It just always felt more natural to me. Um, and it seems like that is what a lot of people are saying now is, Hey, you know what? There might be, there is evidence to suggest that it could be beneficial perhaps the best time to implement it is when you are doing exercises that do not naturally get a lot of resistance in the stretch portion, right? Like maybe like a, a cable row where if you were to stop at full range of motion, I mean, this reminds me when I was in high school and I, you know, everybody, I don't know if you were on like the bodybuilding forums, like, you know, 15 years ago, but uh, I remember submitting a video of my rows and people were like, you know, you're not trying hard enough. You can go so much heavier. And I'm like, well, to go to my stomach, this is the max weight I can use for, let's say, 12 reps. But yes, most of that rep looks so easy because I have to use so much less weight to actually get it there with, you know, consistent um, tempo and whatnot. Uh, so I think intuitively, a lot of people, they then switch eventually to doing these heavy rows where whether or not they realize the mechanism, it's allowing them to load that stretch so much more. Um, do you Do you think that that is essentially what we're getting at with these length and partials is it's just allowing an overload that some exercises naturally have that built in and other ones you really have to think about how to modify it towards that. Um, 
that I think is maybe one of the potential takeaways of this line of research, and we'll know in the next few years. But I think, and this is just my personal opinion, um, that we are one seeing because, like, keep in mind the full range of motion group in our study, they trained to total failure. It wasn't full range of motion failure as some people will do in the gym where they have one hard rep and then they called it there. Like they legit tried and had to grind that extra partial out there. So the one takeaway is that based on the intensity or the proximity of failure research and uh, showing that, hey, being closer to failure is better for gains and based on the literature on um long muscle lengths and hypertrophy it may be that pushing your sets closer to failure and getting that extra partial in or extra couple of partial reps in there may be something to that hypertrophy and we have that one study on length and supersets and how those led to more growth um the other thing is as you said for some muscle groups like the back i think if you like look if you're just trying to get jacked and you don't care about any of this one, you're not listening to this podcast. Two, whatever, just train hard, you'll, you're fine. But if you're trying to gain as much muscle as possible, going, uh, doing lengthened partials uh, for exercises where, as you said, uh, you wouldn't be spending, um, you, you wouldn't be overloading that stress naturally. I think that also makes sense. Again, as an educated bet, right? I don't know if there's, if it actually makes a ton of difference. I assume that it would make yeah. some difference. And lastly, the other thing I would say is that based off of this research, our ROM, your range of motion um, practices can be more flexible than previously thought, which can then potentially impact your proximity to failure. Because when back in the day, we would commit to that, like to that last bit, right? And once that last bit, so I, so I'm obviously like this is audio and I'm doing it on camera. Like I'm I'm showing like the last bit of a lockout on like a bench press, mm -hmm. and as bros, we would commit to that last ten out of ten hard rep and have the spotter above us waiting for us to lock it out. And once we locked it out, that would that was that. But now because you know that hey, sure you don't need to do length and partials and stop midway, but you can be skipping that lockout, you may be able to get more reps on a given set and actually see some more gains simply because you are not just saying, okay, yep, I grinded that rep out, managed to lock it out, the end of the set. Um, your range of motion may be slightly different from the get-go where you're skipping the slide, the, the lockout, and you're st stopping just shy of lockout, therefore spending more time on longer lengths, yada, yada, yada. But I don't know. We shall yeah. see. How are you implementing it in your own training? That's the crazy thing, man. When you see people online losing their shit, I don't know, they they assume that we're there with goniometers and like, <laughs> right. bro, my training is all to failure, to beyond failure, to the point where I can't move whatever I'm doing anymore, even for partials. Um, everything is in the five to like 12 rep range. And I'm just trying to rep the full stack on any stack loaded machine. Uh, and I'm just really pushing myself on every exercise on exercises like rows i'll do a bunch of partials and there are some exercises like lateral raises um some presses where i just do exclusively partials because they don't feel full range of motion doesn't feel that great on one of my elbows and that's it like i'll still do some full range of motion reps but literally training hard and trying to increase the weight on the the bar or the machine every time but just emphasizing the stretch that's that's been key there worst case scenario same gains right like it's literally the, the time commitment and effort to like people also assume that you need to all suddenly become like a yogi master and like, get in these weird positions on a chest press i just set the seat at the forward position so i get a nice stretch on the t-bar uh, row machine i like try to get a bit more of a stretch at the bottom and like that's literally it really minor uh minor changes to traditional sort of training and those are also an educated bet now is that different than like since doing and getting into some of this research has that actually changed or were you somebody who always trained to failure trained until you you know maybe weren't able to move the weight kind of deal uh, no, it has changed for sure. Like, obviously, we, we used to do some more, like, intensify, like, we thought of them as, like, intensity sets and, oh, let's keep repping it with maybe, like, some help and do half reps. But that wasn't as um, 
as common in my training as it is now. Because obviously, like Milo and I met when he started his PhD, and we've been friends for a good few years now. Um, so I got to meet Milo when Milo was a team full range of motion sworn uh, follower. Yeah, and I even I bought saying. him a parcel reps don't count t shirt. That's <laughs> uh, and obviously receipts can be provided as a gift, and there's videos of him wearing it. So like I go to see Milo getting into the literature, and Milo, what you what you see is what you get in reality. Like yeah. it's not a mar marketing gimmick. Um, once he started looking at the research, he was like, huh. And then he just switched to just partials because he was like, these are going to be either the same or slightly better than a full range of motion. So when I started to he hear about the literature from him, I was like, hmm, okay, and started doing so. Because rows, for example, like a barbell row, if it was a half rep, nope, that's the end of the set. We're stopping there. Um, same with lat pull downs. Can't touch the top of my chest. That's the end of the set. Whereas now it's like, cool. We're, we're just going to keep going until I cannot bring the barb to the level of my forearm, uh, the forearm, uh, forehead. <laughs> Stupid Greek. Are you, yeah, go. Yeah, are you, are you, uh, so I, I just, when I think of it, the only issue I have with it, and this is just a me thing, I'm, I'm pretty OCD when it comes to tracking and numbers and all that stuff. And so when I think of, okay, I did 12 reps of a let's say chest supported row and that's a pretty clear thing that i you know you, you just mark it down 12 reps then it starts to be okay if i'm going to do partials i got to make sure my partials are the same range of motion and and i don't actually think this matters at all it's more just in my head i'm just kind of yeah. okay i want the consistency so if i imagine i'm doing 100 range of motion and then that next one got 80 percent, and then it's 70 and 40 and you know 30 percent, whatever i think that's that's great and that's fine I think I have to get over a little bit of, okay, that's just harder to track. And then they're all just, you could just mark them as all partials. And then as long as over time that weight is going up, it's probably fine. But that's just something that comes to my mind. Yeah. I hear, I see people saying that about standardization and it's like, you can standardize them if you really want to and make that effort and be like, cool, uh, my partial endpoint on this machine is when I am bringing the, uh, the whatever, the handle to the seat or whatever you have there, and then track them that way. But I'm not a huge believer, not believer. I'm not like as somebody who grew up in a, the bro era of lifting and the like, yes, we're training close to failure and to failure, and that's a given, and we're pushing every set, every training session as much as we can. Um, the idea that you need to meticulously track everything, as you said, I don't think you're missing out on gains, but I get the OCD sort of like control of my training aspect. I think that if you're doing your shit pardon my french in the gym it's very unlikely that you won't know if you've made progress you know like unless you are even if you're an exceptionally advanced lifter which then begs the question of like okay how much more do you think you have to gain there like, exactly yeah it's 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 over uh that's another thing people discount heavily it's like if you if you don't know if you're making progress, you're either freestyling things to an absurd extent, extent because I've been freestyling as well. Like I, I don't have a fixed program, and I know that on the lat pull down, full stack, used to be able to do two reps a year and a half ago. I can do eight reps now for the same amount of sets, so it's good. But unless you're doing different exercises every session and doing all sorts of weird stuff, you will know. You like you will be damn sure that you're making progress regardless of whether you did two partials extra or whatever right and then yeah an easy workaround is so you just look at the number of reps you got with the full range of motion and over time like let's say it's, it's 10 and then added partials partials is just like an add-on at the end until you can't do them anymore and then the next yeah. time it's 11 and etc so exactly exactly that nobody didn't make gains because they couldn't uh they they couldn't track the like it's it's a bit of a fear mongering same same as with fatigue and partials because uh, that's what I've been seeing fatigue with partials and training to failure people make such a huge deal over those things and yes if you're doing deadlifts to failure and you see that you're unable to walk for three days I'd bet that if you did them very frequently you'd still be fine but like if you're consistently training close to failure or doing partials you are not looking at uh, you're going to get used to it um, pretty, pretty quickly. And it's not such a big of a concern and it's nothing that you cannot circumvent by like, okay, 
Is your food on point? Is your sleep on point? How are you feeling? How's performance? If you see that performance is dropping off over time, sure, make some adjustments, but really not uh, something people should be losing their minds over. For sure. Yeah. You know, you discuss with the advanced trainee, it's like it's over. <laughs> and, you know, for anybody who's heard the podcast, it's something I do bring up quite a bit that obviously at some point, if, if you're a natural lifter, you know, you're, you're really just not going to be making huge leaps and bounds anymore. And I think that's one of the tough things when you have people who criticize studies and they say, well, these weren't advanced trainees. And I know in the recent study we talked about, they, they actually did have some some good experience there. But I just think if you're trying to find people who have had, let's say, 15 serious years in the gym, either you're never going to find anything or the study would have to be so long to find any differences between groups. It's just not practical. I mean, you know, I've, I've maybe put on an eighth of an inch of my arms in the last couple of years at the same leanness. I mean, it's just, it's almost impossible to detect. Yeah, bro. hundred percent, man. And that's another thing people assume, and we have our own echo chambers and it's our fault as lifters as well. Like I am not a genetic freak by no means, but like from what I remember your physique as well, like you are somebody who's blessed solid genetics, I assume. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not actually too gifted. And I don't say that as somebody who, you know, you see some people who have amazing physiques and then they say, oh no, it's just all hard work. That's not me at all. I just, I mean, I'm pretty uh, average in terms of my physique. I would say I'm 6'1", 185, beach lean, like nothing crazy at all. Like Steve Hall, for example, is mm. would be notably bigger than me. Sure. Fair enough. But Steve Hall is also a pro bodybuilder. And that's what I mean by by the echo chamber where like if you show your physique to the average gym goer, so I have your picture up now. I assume like there's no like no heavy like I can just see you're in your house in your yeah, um, yeah, yeah. bathroom. Like you show that physique and your arms to the average gym goer. Many people will not be able to reach that stage, but because we are in these echo chambers where it's normal for people to be jacked, like that, just being jacked is something that many people, especially in clothes, may not be able to reach. Sure. And then there is this assumption that oh, everybody can be everybody can be more jacked than they were when they started, but not everybody will be able to turn heads or walk around and get compliments on like oh wow, you're a jacked dude, if that makes sense. Um, sure. And then you couple that up with the fact that muscle growth takes time and significantly slows after a certain point. And you then get people that are essentially chasing something that they will never get. And they feel that they're doing something wrong when in reality, the it's just that it wasn't meant for them. Obviously, they can be very jacked and have an amazing physique um, compared to what they had when they started. But it's important to also understand, like, just because all of my friends can rep 500 plates, 500 plates, 500 pounds, 500 <laughs> plates would be either a lie or I have some pretty strong friends. But just because all like a 500 kilo deadlift is nothing in my in my circle of friends. Like 500 the pounds, majority, you mean. 500 pound, yeah. Sorry, did I say kilo? You did, yeah. My friends are Eddie Hall. Yeah, and I was going to say, <laughs> right? You got some really elite friends. <laughs> yeah, it's like just because in our circle, that's nothing. Like for sure. the majority of like commercial gym lifters and lifters who like geek out, geek out and follow like Jeff Nippert and stuff, for many of them, 500 may be like a lifetime goal. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not sure if you if you get where I'm going with this, but like people don't take that in consideration. Oh, yeah, no, my my I mean, you're you're definitely preaching to the choir here. I mean, one of my the video actually I'm most proud of on my channel that took a long time. It was like forty to forty plus minute video talks about the influence of genetics, and um, I'm sure you know Johnny Candido, uh, and, and he yes, and and he uh, I had a clip in this long video about him saying, and he he specifically said that he thinks most people can hit a 500 pound deadlift with moderate training or sorry, 500 pound squat with moderate training. And yep. it, it was just such an example of somebody who is just so out of touch with reality because of their incredible genetics, work ethic, their surroundings. Uh, and I gave examples how, you know, like even like blessed people, um, I gave 3DMJ as an example. Alberto Nunez, after 20 plus years in good genetics, finally hit a 500 pound squat. Uh, Jeff Alberts, they, like they had a competition among them. They never hit it. The, the point being without going on too much of a tangent is these things can be uh, very much lost among the groups. And uh, 500 pound squat is 
extremely impressive and many, many people will never get there. I never got there. Um, that's why I'm saying to you as a 21 year old doing 600 pounds, I mean, that is freakish level strength, you know, absolutely at that age. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very easy to get lost and, and even probably to my, to, with myself to some degree, I, I will stand by that. Like if you talk to anybody who's met me in person, I, I look pretty normal, like just like a, a regular lifter. Um, but I, you know, I, I post some pumped pictures with some good lighting that can, that I can help out with that. But, uh, but in reality, yes, even for myself, I know that there's other people who wouldn't look like me, you know, and, yeah. um, it's just it, the genetics is such a huge aspect for sure. Yeah. Genetics frame and which muscles, uh, like I'm blessed with a white clavicle structure, big chest and a big back, which immediately automatically because I'm fatter as well in a t-shirt, I stand out. Um, you may get somebody who is as advanced as me in terms of reaching their muscular potential, but just because they don't don't have the same structure and they're slightly narrower, they may be a pro bodybuilder, but in clothes, they will look smaller. Yeah. The, the, where I'm getting at with this is that online, you see pictures without a direct comparison. You're seeing obviously the best pictures and you're seeing like other variables like lightning and clothing is controlled. And then you form this, this illusion in your head that there's giants and absolute like freaks walking around. Whereas if you saw Alberto Nunes, which many people will say, oh, you know, or back in the day was the whole natty or not thing. Like if you see Alberto Nunes at the supermarket wearing um, his T-shirt and, and like you'll be able to see that he's a muscular individual, but you won't be like, whoa, yeah, here comes the sure. giant, you know, yeah, the yeah. shelves are shaking. So what's your body weight? Just, just so, to... well, I just finished a diet to probably the leanest I've been. So I'm I'm like low 180s right now at 6'1". So, um, you know, so 81 six, kilos, right? So if you did a 500 kilo, 500 kilo, 500 pound squat based on all of the competitive number, competitive powerlifting results at the moment, that was the worst way to say that sentence based on the open powerlifting.org database right now, there's a website where you can check your strength versus powerlifters. Okay. And when we're comparing to three thirty one thousand competitive powerlifters, if you hit a 500-pound squat at your body weight, your squat would be better than 90%, better or equal to 90%. So you'd be in the top 10%. Of competitive powerlifters. Of competitive powerlifters. Now, right. think of the commercial, like gym goers or lifters. Right. like, And that's where, what I tell people. like You have to think in percentiles. It's the same with your income. Like you can't, you have to apply those standards there. Like with your in, with people's incomes, people will get a solid job and they'll be like, "Whoa, I'm making X amount." They don't think, "Yeah, but like the millionaires out there, yeah, I don't compare to the top five percent." They're like, "Wow, I'm doing amazing because I'm doing so much better than everybody else on earth." Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, man. I uh, I said in that video, I actually now again. This is probably going to sound maybe odd to you and, and people who work out at like really serious gyms. I've worked out at, I don't know, 15 gyms over the years, some long term, some short term. I've actually never seen in person a 500 pound squat outside of two people. Um, like it's just not in a commercial gym. Now, again, obviously, somebody like you, everybody does it. But I'm just saying as somebody who worked at it, like LA Fitness and retros and stuff like that. It's just exceptionally rare to see like a, especially a, a full range of motion. 500 pound squat, man. It's just, you know, it's just not something that's, that's typical. And I'm not trying to also, uh, lessen people's potential or say, don't go after these things. Obviously I've had some pretty high goals and some of them I hit and some of them I haven't. I'm just saying you got to keep it in perspective of, of what's reality. And, and even like with income and stuff like that, obviously you can go on social media and look at like all these, you know, extremely successful people. And, uh, I never want to dampen down people's hopes or expectations, but, you just got to stay grounded to some degree. Yeah, for sure. And I train at a commercial gym, believe it or not. It's my favorite gym to train at. And I've been training there for 11 years while also appearing of the powerlifting and more like strength focused gyms in my city. Um, and exactly the same. Uh, uh, for a five plate deadlift, you're turning heads in that gym and you don't see it often. Um, but like you will know from relatively early whether you are going to be one of those people that can, you know, be in the top 10, 15, 5% strength wise. Um, you will know pretty soon. Like with, a, with squats, I'm a blessed squatter. Obviously, I was a heavy guy as well, right? I was 120 kilos when I started squatting, but I squatted 440 within the first month of squatting. Um, and 
like in my head, I was like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah, four plate squat plus, that should be easy for everyone. But then as I got older and I got to want to coach a lot of people, and that's where my observations, which are also confirmed by, you know, strength standards in general and what I just mentioned with comparing to other powerlifters, um, that changed my perspective. Because when you coach people and you're like, they're doing everything right, you're seeing video footage of their lifts, so you know form and intensity of effort are there, they're eating, they're gaining body weight, they are doing hypertrophy work, blah, blah, blah. And you're seeing like 225, like people that weigh 220 pounds, unable to bench over like like 120 kilos, like 260, 270. And yeah. like despite trying and working together for years, that then also shifts your perspective to like, it's not that they are doing the wrong thing or that they're making excuses because you see that they're doing everything. It's that unfortunately, there's many people, the majority of people are not going to be able to achieve exceptional strength uh, as it's um, shown on social media yes our like it, it appears like everybody can because of our echo chambers and social groups like all my friends are strong like my yeah. sister can can deadlift near nearly four plates oh wow and and she's not she's like 70 kilos at my height at 510 so she's not like some fucking freak yeah, um, yeah. milo can uh, has deadlifted nearly 600 for five uh, and has squatted 440 for 10 ass to grass, paused, no sleeves, no nothing. Um, so like, just because we are more attracted to other lifters and then we see one muscularity being relatively common in our circles and strength also being a really like a thing that everybody can have, that's not the reality for the major the average lifter that follows us and consumes the information we put out there. Yeah, the coaching is a huge aspect too. That was another thing I had mentioned in that long video of mine that it, it can be very eye-opening because obviously many people, they think it's all their hard work and whatnot. And and when you, and, and it's understandable because oftentimes these people are working really hard. Uh, but, you know, coaching people myself, I noticed it. Uh, and I mentioned how I also noticed it with tutoring in college and just seeing mm. like, oh, wow, like these people, they're just not grasping it or picking it up as quickly as I would expect. And you see that obviously as you go up in, in education and get a doctor or whatever else, you you start to see some people that just can no longer keep up with that level. Um, and, and it happens in a lot of areas of life. So I'm, so I'm curious, outside of the 600 pound squat, obviously gifted there, what is something that you've noticed in life, could be lifting or not, where you realize that you had a, a knack for it and you were gifted and maybe another area, um, if you want to share where you realize maybe this is not something that I'm going to be able to keep up with or was not as gifted in. Yeah, for sure. So I have ADHD, uh, which is a gift and a curse in the sense that I can do multiple things uh, almost simultaneously and I can knock out like I used to do assignments last minute and still get good grades. And I'm able to sort of like glance over something and, and get the gist of it, depending obviously on, on, on what it is. Uh, but at the same time, I don't have a strong mathematical mind. Um, and some concepts I need to actually like draw them out to fully grasp them. So that's one positive and one negative. Um, I, um, I guess it's it's those things. Like there, there, there are things in my daily life that I can balance. Uh, so doing like working multiple jobs. Like we went to New York to do the study, which we we don't get paid to do those studies. Like those are on our time. Mm. Obviously, we got funding for the Airbnb and the the flights there. But at the same time, we were also releasing two to three videos a week and writing articles and recording podcasts and coaching 60 to not 60 at the time, 40 ish clients and being able to juggle all that. I think that's a skill that I have by nature because of the ADHD and being relatively quick with certain things. But at the same time, um, I'm a bit slower with, with, uh, with other things. And because I get easily distracted, even when I'm trying to focus sometimes i will need to like reread over something multiple times or i'll ask for somebody to explain it to me so then i can have that explanation and refer to it but uh yeah i guess that's that i've seen a couple of people who are highly successful in the industry who have talked about adhd um, mike israel being one of them and, and how um it's allowed him i guess again like you said blessing and a curse right so i think he medicates for or maybe he did at one point and, and maybe you know i don't know all the details there but 
it's just interesting that you, you see a lot of these very successful people talk about how they have a hard time focusing and everything. I've never gone through the process of even trying to be diagnosed. I've joked about how I have OCD or ADHD. I'm very detail oriented and you know, my mind's always going to a million different things. So I don't know if, if I would actually be diagnosed, but I don't, I don't do anything for it other than just try to put myself into more projects really. Yeah. It, for me, the diagnosis helped with um, understanding myself better and understanding that, oh, that's why these things were hard back in the day or at school. Although there were other um, elements that made school harder than it should have been. But it just helped with that. It um, allowed me to understand that there's this thing going on and I'm able to pause sometimes and go like, okay, are we being impulsive now because of ADHD? And we're like, okay, let's do it now. I want to now. I want to do it now. I want to do it. Like, like, and then I, I G-check myself based on the diagnosis. Same with anxiety disorder where when you think that, oh, there's something happening to me, I'm dying. After the diagnosis, you're like, it's the anxiety disorder playing up. And then you're able to calm yourself down because you know that that's what's playing up, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So I just want to talk a little bit about Stronger by Science in general, because in the last, I mean, really, since you and Milo have joined, I, you know, there's kind of been a resurgence in the number of videos, of course, you guys are, are really spearheading that. I know you've had the podcast that you guys do with with Greg as well. Um, but a lot of the videos that have been with you guys. So um, he at all talk about or elucidate on that, that project of joining Stronger by Science and kind of what the hope is for you guys going forward with the company? Yeah, sure. So Stronger by Science was, if you were ever a student of mine at university, you had heard about Stronger by Science uh, be way before I was involved in any sort of capacity. Both Milo and I grew up uh, as like people in this uh, space following Stronger by Science and getting a lot of quality information from the articles and the podcast. And essentially the vision is to provide the best possible science-based content for people that are interested in lifting and all things muscle and strength related. So that's the vision. And that's why we've been on the YouTube harder than before, obviously trying to play the game while still keeping the brand's sort of uh, style in place. But it's a hard thing to do. People don't don't realize that nowadays, if you don't play the game to an extent with titles and like thumbnails, your efforts may go to waste and nobody will watch that 15 minute reference uh, heavy video if they don't click on it in the first place. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's the vision. The vision is to just bring high quality science-based information uh, that is easily accessible by people. And also the one thing that we're trying to do because we've moved away uh, or at least further away from written content is to also allow newer lifters who may not be as science, uh, science-based and more science-informed um, so that we sort of remove that barrier and allow them to consume that sort of information because Stronger by Science has a big following that consists of a lot of people that are like, I've had clients from Stronger by Science that are PhDs in like mm -hmm. physics, maths, uh, the engineers, software engineers, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and it's also like opening the door to people that may not be the super geeks that are also interested in lifting, but are people that would watch, you know, a video made by um, Vsauce or something and be like, oh, the science of muscle growth. Cool, let me watch this 10 minute video. Yes, it's not everything that I will ever need to know. And it's not a 70,000 word article by Greg Knuckles that will take yeah. <laughs> me six days to digest. But oh, nice. Oh, this, this science-based thing looks cool. Oh, let me watch another video. Let me read now the article. Let me listen to the podcast. Uh, so that's the idea there. Yeah, I I know Greg had some very long articles in the past, and I I would still say they're they're a great reference for a lot of people. 100%. I do think it's tough these days to get people to spend that much time on a single anything really. I mean, unfortunately, it's just hard to keep people's attention, especially in, in written format like that. And even myself, I, I mean, I listen to all of the mass reviews, but I, I listen to the audio. It's just very convenient when I'm driving or doing something else versus sitting down. It's just hard to find the time um, or, or the, the mental bandwidth at times. But I think you guys, as far as the thumbnails, I know there's some controversy with certain people. I mean, oh, Mike Israel has gotten some flack for that. But at least the way I've seen it in the fitness industry, I'm not really seeing anything egregious. Like there's certain areas of content that I do see it where people are having a thumbnail that is just completely, they'll put something in quotes and it wasn't said by the 
person who's on there at all. I mean, she's completely outlandish. But from what I've seen of you guys, it's a very healthy level of it. And I think it is engaging without going at all too far. Um, and I've, I've noticed this even myself. I mean, my last video had five times the views that uh, most of my videos get. And it was just like putting up two well-known people and there's an arrow of this one's wrong. And like, I explain why it's wrong and all that stuff. But just it's unfortunate because sometimes you just want to talk about like the nerdy science of stuff. And there's a balance, of course, and I'm not uh, trying to complain about it. It is the game that has to be played. Otherwise, your message will never be heard. But uh, it, it just is more and more going to the TikTok generation type attention grabbing stuff. Yeah, and but like at the end of the day, people can complain all they want. The goal with and for you as a creator as well is to get your content to as many people as possible, but to also have them watch it. That's a thing that people miss. They think, oh, the views. No, we don't care about the views. If the 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 view duration is a thirty Retention. seconds, yeah, yeah, like people are that that, that doesn't work because if people consistently uh, associate you with, uh, okay, they've now posted this and that. Like I'm gonna click on the video and it's something else. I'm not gonna click on it. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but a great example is we did an interview with uh, Eric Helms on bulking, and. We he had already done the same video with Mike, um, but it hadn't been released at the time, so we didn't know of it. And it was the because like Eric is really good at speaking as well, so sometimes with certain things he is like a cassette tape, like all of us. Yeah, so like yeah. you ask me about minimum of those trainings, like whoop, cassette in, press play, blah 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 blah. The same yeah, 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 sure. So I watched the the video, uh, which was framed as bulking is dead and the thumbnail was mike is retail fat and don't be this guy and we essentially had the exact same video with eric obviously on a different channel but in order to get people to engage with it because like many people that haven't hadn't watched mike's video would still benefit from the information but we we didn't want to make we didn't want to present it as oh it's the same video we spun it and we essentially named it is bulking really dead featuring Eric Helms and Eric on the thumbnail with gain muscle and lose fat because he does talk about some of the studies in beginners where they did gain, they bulked and gained muscle and lost fat. Um, and the video did really well, despite being the exact same video. And it brought new viewers that uh, wouldn't have clicked on it otherwise just because of that. Um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of false clickbait. Like if you're expecting to see something and you don't get it at all yeah. but slight hyperbole like let's say um we had brad schoenfeld on where we talked about minimum dose and the least you need to do now brad is known for volume the thumbnail was brad saying you don't need much volume Saw that, what, yeah. yeah this th and that's what we say the entire video because the video is titled the simplest way to gain muscle not to maximize muscle right and but simply because it's brad saying you don't need much volume People are like, whoa, whoa he's, <laughs> he's flip-flopping. And he, yeah, he right. and it's like, bro, if you actually even read the papers that people hate on, it says it in those papers as well, that yeah, you know, yeah. to make solid gains. Anyways, all that to say that people assume that the game is simple and it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, clickbait title. But it really isn't. And things that you think will pop don't pop. And then you're like, uh, why didn't this do well? Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the net... Outcome is positive. So getting more people to watch good quality uh, videos by getting them to click on them, that's the goal. Not to just click on them. Just clicking on them doesn't count for anything. Yeah, I think it's also got to be tough for people like you guys who are in academia because when you got you guys have such high standards, right? When you're getting a PhD or your your professor, the standards are so high, and you are teaching and appealing to you know, we talk about like the lowest common, common denominator, you're kind of appealing to the highest common denominator, right? Like you are appealing to the people who are there to nerd out, who are the most intelligent. And the reality is, maybe this is offensive to some, but the reality is when you are on YouTube or Instagram, you are really appealing to the masses and, and at times maybe even, you know, like less educated people. And so it's like, well, if I'm trying to get the most views, that's not the people with PhDs, right? That is the people who are zero to five years into lifting who, you know, they're, they're just not going to have the attention span. And you, unfortunately, you spend your entire lives trying to excel at, at again, academia, teaching, et cetera. And now you're saying, Hey, to succeed, you have to bring all that down. 
And it's not that it's easy. You have to do it. It could be harder. You have to do it in another way. But who you're appealing to completely, completely different now. It's much harder, man. It's super easy for me to do a a geek out video with no B roll and no like just just yapping about a paper for forty five minutes. That's super. That's simple. That's the simplest formula to make a video where I get the other person to engage with it for 10 plus minutes and to get people that don't know the lingo, though are not part of the small sub niche of the sub niche. Like that's challenging. And my mother, who's an educator as well, she like one quote that has stayed with me uh, that she told me is that you, in order to get the learner where they want to go, you have to meet them where they are. And at the end of the day, I'm not making content for the academics like that's why we release papers and the, the papers are as detailed and as nuanced and as academic as they need to be uh, and that's why we present at conferences and yada 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 but when it comes to the you know to 18 year old pack who like i'm trying to appeal to the, the mm -hmm. lifter who doesn't is not a scientist nor does he care about the statistics or this or that or the other and just wants to learn okay how can i take this and apply to my training because we are an applied field at the end of the day it's good to say mm, we don't have enough evidence for this and there's uncertainty and yada 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 that's all great but at the end of the day i have chosen lifting as my thing and i want to talk to people that also have chosen lifting as their thing and help them to make their training slightly better or at least give them something to watch uh, that uh, revolves around that hobby that is essentially you know not changing the world but if for some people it is changing their world you know where i'm going with this yeah yeah for sure for sure so i'm just curious if like in your heart of hearts is that something you and obviously it's hard to get you know an on, an on the spot exact answer here but if, if you had the choice you said okay income is the same all of, everything else is the same you can just teach and you're going to make x amount or you could be youtube celebrity and, and make x amount would you just prefer to say hey, i'd rather just teach or do or you enjoy making this kind of content I wouldn't teach. Uh, I thought I wanted to teach and I started teaching from a very young age. I've taught at two universities here and I've done like conferences and stuff. But uh, if I had to choose between teaching and YouTube, YouTube all day because you can simply reach more people. And at university, you uh, ma many people assume that everybody that goes to university, given how much it costs in many countries, they're going to be driven and engaged. You often, at least from my experience, get a few solid students that are really into it. And then you get a lot of students that don't really care. But if you told me, hey, Pac, you are financially free today. What are you doing? I'd be doing research for free, as I'm doing now. And I'd be pouring a lot of money into research, as we've been doing now to an extent. Um, and I would also still make content just without the pressure of like, okay, you know, if there's the odd week where I can't release a video, whatever. But I... The content side of things is not for the celebrity or the the status. It's to educate people, and because it's it's fun from a creative perspective. Because I'm a relatively creative individual, I've been doing music for a good time in my of my life, and that's something yeah, most cool. people don't know in this subgenre of things. Um, but yeah, I would choose to do more research and spend more time there. But I would still make content. I wouldn't teach per se. I would do yeah. research though. No, I, I feel you on that for sure. That, that's kind of how, like, with me making the content, it, it's not my primary vocation. It's, so there's not really any pressure to produce content outside of whatever pressure I put on myself. So the plus side of that, of course, is there's there's not really any burnout with it, and it's just an enjoyable thing. Um, and, you know, unless for whatever reason I wanted to, I, I, I can't imagine just putting, like, 50 hours a week into it, like some people do if they say, hey, you know what, this is now what I'm going to do full time. So um, pros and cons to it, but the lack of pressure is obviously, you know, a nice aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, man. So, well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know we had to move some things around. So, thanks for your flexibility there. Um, you. And obviously, people have heard us talk about it a number of times on this podcast now, but where can people find you? Uh, on YouTube at the Dr. Pack. I know, cringe, but hey, look, I couldn't come out there as Patroclus and likes Karakakis or Pack because you Google Pack, you're getting shit. Um, so Dr. Pack on YouTube and Instagram. And if you then go on any of those platforms, you can find all my research on ResearchGate. Um, there's always links there. But yeah, if you're one of those people that cares about reading the actual research, ResearchGate is being kept up to date and all the research is over there. Awesome. Thanks again, man. 
Thank you.